I am thrilled to actually be on the same couch stage with you, Jen. <laughs> um, we don't actually get to see each other very much because we're on separate coast. But at Redfin, we've really started looking at diversity and inclusion in the past few years. You and I have been involved in this effort along with Bridget and Glenn. I want to talk about the success and where we've ended up and where we're going to go. But first, I want to go back to the beginning. The title of this panel is Zero to 30. So I want to go to number two. You were the second engineer hired at Redfin. What was that like? Uh, right, so I, I joined Redfin back in 2008. I was the second female engineer. Um, and it was pretty different. Redfin was a much smaller company. Uh, besides being the second female engineer, I was just the seventh engineer uh, <laughs> based out of the San Francisco office. So uh, it was very different. The people back then and still um, were really great and that was a big reason why I joined to begin with. Um, super friendly, extremely smart, um, and what I could tell when I joined was that the company culture was such that um, the company was willing to, you know, take a hard look at itself, admit flaws, and just focus on improving. Um, so that was really appealing to me. Um, also, I believed in the, the Redfin mission, which is to use technology to make the home buying and selling process better for consumers. And finally, there was a really long list of exciting technical projects, and I knew I was going to learn a lot as an engineer. Was there anything you didn't like? Was it all like puppies and rainbows? <laughs> uh, no. Uh, so to be honest, I actually didn't enjoy working at Redfin uh, for the first two years. I would say approximately the first two years Come I was there, which is a long time. <laughs> That's a long time not to like like a job. Why why didn't you like it? Um, so, you know, when you join a small team if there are differences between yourself and the team, it's very apparent. And so I was the seventh engineer in the SF office and right off the bat, I, I didn't feel like I belonged. Um, it, was a, it was a close knit group of, um, at least compared to me, they were much more extroverted. And um, at the time, the company really valued people who were outspoken, willing to interrupt people to get a word in. And uh, that just wasn't my style. And so I didn't feel like I belonged. And I think it's pretty safe to say that my career wasn't really going places my first couple of years at Redfin because of this. And, um, you know, it was pretty hard for me to admit this to myself. You know, prior to Redfin, I viewed myself as a very successful engineer. I was a senior software developer. I had been promoted at previous companies and I had um, great endorsements from, from past managers. And so to come to a company um, and suddenly feel like you didn't belong, that really caused me to question my abilities. And so that wavering in my confidence actually translated to, um, to my work suffering. Um, so, yeah. That's really interesting, because often we think about inclusion and performance as two very different things. Mm -hmm. But your experience is that that loss of confidence actually affected your performance. That's right. But you're still here. Still you're actually <laughs> a VP. <laughs> so something must have changed in the interim. What changed for you? What was the turning point? So um, as often as the case, things had to get worse before they got better. And um, there was a turning point, and that was when we hired our third female, uh, uh, the third woman to our San Francisco team. And um, like me, she had, a, she had a very similar experience to me when she joined. Uh, she didn't feel like she belonged, and she struggled. But unlike me, she actually didn't end up staying at Redmond for very long. And um, her departure really affected me because it hit so close to home. And... Um, I was pretty angry, I would say. I was pretty angry that we had spent all these months trying to hire someone onto the team. We found someone that we were excited about, that we thought was smart. And then um, when it mattered the most, we didn't give her the opportunity to find out if she could have been successful. And um, I was also annoyed because I spent all this time recruiting and we weren't anywhere closer to making our way down that list of exciting projects that I was talking about. Um, and so that was a really big aha moment for me. 
which is that having a great work culture, one that's supportive and allows all different types of people to feel like they belong, has a direct tie to business impact, right? If you can't attract and retain top talent, you're not gonna be able to execute on your company's plans. And that was the turning point where I realized something needed to change in our company culture if we were gonna succeed. Right, and you know, before I came to Redfin, I really didn't think of engineers, no offense, as advocates for diversity. <laughs> <laughs> but actually, our experience at Redfin is that engineering is leading the diversity charge. Um, and it started in those moments of despair in San Francisco, <laughs> a lot of it, it sounds like. And instead of just <clears throat> complaining or quitting, what did you do to, to start things being better. Mm -hmm. So actually around the time, um, I started reporting to our first uh, female engineer. She was my boss. And um, I felt like I could confide in her and express to her my frustrations. And she, she convinced me that I needed to do something about it and not just play victim. And so I had an idea, which was to start the Redfin Buddy program, which was to pair engineers or, or any employee really with a new hire help them navigate our organization, get assimilated, help answer those questions that they might be afraid to ask um, their, their manager. Um, and I really want to credit our CTO at the time, who was a very talented man. Um, in a sink or swim culture, 10 times out of 10, he, he would swim. And so when I, when I approached him with my idea and I, and I talked to him about the problem I was trying to solve, he could not relate. Like, he just probably has never needed mentorship ever in his life. Um, and, but, but I credit him because he recognized that two reasonable, intelligent people could have two different experiences at the same company. And so he listened to me, and he was very supportive, and he let me run with a, with a buddy program. Um, so we launched that, and we launched it, um, I think it was during the summertime, so we happened to have a lot of new hires, whether they were interns or people um, graduating from college. They were starting, so we, we trialed the buddy program on them and almost immediately got pretty positive feedback and we saw different types of people um, being able to be more successful um, at Redfin. But what did that, that buddy program did sound very successful, but did it have a direct relationship to diversity? Were you still <laughs> recruiting the same people and now they were happier or at least onboarded a little faster? What really changed from a diversity perspective? Right, so, so the buddy program, um, kind of branched from there. So uh, over time, it morphed into a more formal mentorship program, which provided on-the-job skills training. And I think related to these initiatives, somewhere in there, I was promoted to being an engineering manager. Um, and then I helped lead engineering, our engineering effort to build out our new hire training program, which Bridget described earlier today. And so I can't say that Redfin started with some explicit diversity initiative, and that's how we got to 29, 30% women. But um, what we did was we focused first on building the right work culture, one that's supportive, inclusive, and, and lets any, any type of person be successful. So we just wanted to have, do the right thing, period. Um, but what we didn't realize at the time was we were laying the foundation um, in building out program pieces that allowed us to have actual diversity initiatives later on. So um, back then we were recruiting from the top 25 computer science programs in the nation. Um, turns out that's what every tech company does, <laughs> and there's, so there's a lot of competition there. Um, and so we realized that you know, there's, there's a whole untapped talent pool where there's really smart people coming from non-traditional backgrounds um, who didn't necessarily attend computer science programs or have professional software engineering training, and we could hire them because we had, the, we had built out the ability in-house to train them and, and let them be successful. So was there any pushback of bringing non-traditional uh, engineering types into the fold? And what about the onboarding process made them able to transition into a full-fledged developer that you needed to perform? Well, I think initially people were a little bit wary and confused, and I think that's natural, but pretty quickly when we saw success, it was just like, oh yeah, we gotta do it. Um, and you know, we, we were still hiring who we thought were really smart and had curiosity and had the right values, and so it really just became, it was about us um, 
teaching them the hard skills, which often is easier to do than, mm -hmm. than some of the soft skills. It's interesting because so often when you, we talk about diversity and, and especially recruitment, it's all about we don't want to lower the bar. Right. But in some sense, you kind of just opened it up and then elevated the candidate to the bar that you needed to be set. Mm -hmm. would, th would that be a... Um, yeah, would I would you say, challenge yeah, that I notion? Would so. Yeah. So, well, Julie in the last panel gave us permission to talk about our shared experiences. Okay. Um, so, <laughs> we both shared the experience of motherhood, as have many in this room. Um, so, this is something that happened to you as well. You took maternity <laughs> leave in Silicon Valley as a woman in tech. You didn't. I don't know if you froze your eggs or not, but you actually had a real life child while working. How did that work and can you share that experience? Yeah, so I have a 17 month old daughter and uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, going through that experience of preparing for this, this thing, person, <laughs> um, was, was really enlightening for me as an engineering manager. So this would have been early 2016. I was preparing for my maternity leave and I was thinking about what support I would need from the company. And I, I reflected back to the earlier years when we, we, we did have one or two women who were working moms. And it occurred to me in 2016 that years ago we had women in the office and they were pumping in the bathroom stall and they were, one, one mom was pumping in our server closet and I just, like, I never thought about it until I was facing it myself, and I was embarrassed, um, it, but it is what it is. And so fast forward to 2016, uh, things have changed and we've become more diverse. Two other women in the San Francisco office were due within two weeks of me. Um, and, and also suddenly I'm in a position of leadership where I have some influence. And um, so I could say, no, we need a proper wellness room um, and, and it was done. <laughs> so that was really cool. Um, and then the other cool thing was in 2016, I, by then I had been reporting to Bridget, our CTO, um, who is a working mom, and um, she was able to give me some really, really great critical advice that changed how I prepared for maternity leave. Oh, you, you can't just lead in with that. <laughs> what was the advice that she gave you that was critical? Um, so I had been spending a lot of time preparing my team for my absence, right? I was planning on taking 16 weeks, and I was really worried that the office was going to keep the lights on while, while I was gone. So I was really <laughs> focused on that. Um, and Bridget said, yeah, you should do that, but actually there's this other thing that's much harder that you haven't even mentioned, which is have you thought about what it's going to feel like when you re-enter the workforce? Like that is actually really hard. Uh, let's talk about that. And, you know, not having been a mom before, I, I, I didn't know what she meant. And um, she really prepared me for some things that would have been surprises otherwise. Um, she told me it would be disorienting coming back. I would probably be just a little bit tired. Um, I would need some time to kind of um, get back into the, to the groove. She also pointed out that I had a really strong team of managers who would be able to step up in my absence. They would take on new responsibilities and I couldn't just expect to come back after 16 weeks and take it all back, right? Um, and so she prepared me. She let me know that I would probably feel confused and that I would need to think about my priorities and what my role would be like after I came back. That's great advice. And I think that advice and the whole concept of a wellness room may be intended to pump, but actually a wellness room can be used to meditate or to, when I broke my leg, I had to stretch in a wellness room. I didn't want my butt in the air and in the middle of the, the <laughs> office. So I went to the wellness room and stretched. Um, it shows how diversity can actually, meant for one group, can be expanded mm -hmm. for, for all groups. It's not just women who use wellness rooms. It's not just women who need to be prepared right. to take time off or to have children. Mm -hmm. Can you speak to, a little bit to that, how, how that gender diversity can affect a different type of people of all backgrounds? Well, I mean, definitely, right? Like, I'm a woman, but I'm also other things. Uh, <laughs> I'm also a minority in other ways. And so you start unpacking um, unpacking some of the issues that people bump up against and the whole thing unravels. And so, you know, we've 
we're at 30% women, which is which uh, is pretty good for the industry. Um, but we have we have a long ways to go in other in, in other areas, and um, I think as we've had more conversations within Redfin, we're, we're just becoming more and more aware of how much more we need to do to be a supportive environment. So one of the pitfalls of maternity leave is that you come back. Well, you go in with one job, and then you come back and you have another job. <laughs> And sometimes it's on a different track called the mommy track. Um, that didn't exactly happen to you. Four months after you came back from maternity leave, you were promoted. Is it that right? That's right. <laughs> yeah, so, um, so I came back. Before this, I was director of San Francisco Engineering. Um, my first month back was a total haze. It was just surviving day to day. I was running off of three, or, three to four hours of sleep, one hour at a time. Um, and so Any I was in the wellness room or <laughs> <laughs> no. <laughs> um, and so, so first I was just trying to survive. And then after that, because Bridget had prepared me for all of this, she was really critical in giving me some of that air cover so that I could, I could take the time to figure out what my priorities were in life. Um, what kind of schedule my family could support, what kind of work life balance I wanted. And so I did that for a little while. And after a couple months, I called her up and I said, I'm all in. And uh, she promoted me to VP of Engineering. Fantastic. <laughs> <laughs> so is it possible then, I guess in your experience, it's very much so possible to have this kick-ass tech career and still be a young mother? I sure hope so. <laughs> That's what I'm trying to do. <laughs> um, I, uh, I, I think so. So far, I think it's, it's working out OK. It, it definitely takes a lot of. Um, a willingness to be open about the situation that you're in, having people around you who are supportive and understanding, I mean, that, that has helped a lot. Right. I also need to, I meant to point out earlier that, you know, my learning coming out of this is that you can have the best team at your company, the most um, well-intentioned, most empathetic people, but sometimes it still takes someone having walked a mile in your shoes to really know how to support you, and that's another reason why having a diverse team is, is really important. So you've had the benefit of having female managers. I, when I had young children, I, I did not. I had male managers. Um, do you think that it's important or necessary to have female managers in a role for other women to succeed, to and have this kind of balance, a great career, and a, and a young family as well? Um, obviously, it's important. I don't think it's necessary. Maybe this is controversial. but. Um you know, in the war, in the industry, there's still there's still men and there's still male managers, and so everybody needs to figure out how to support people of all different backgrounds. Mm -hmm. um, and I would say, in my life, most of my advocates until more recently have been men, right? So early on, I spent a lot of time with my dad and my older brother, and never did they make me feel like I was disadvantaged because I was a girl. And so for that, I'm very thankful. Um, and then in my early career, all of my bosses were men, but they were some of my greatest professional advocates. They sought out opportunities for me. They advocated for me. And so I think it's possible to get places with, with male managers, but um, there's something special about having, having women in leadership, uh, but it's going to take everybody. Right, right. When my children were young, I didn't have that. Now that they're adolescents, I do have a fabulous female manager. I'll tell you, the challenges of a 12-year-old are a little bit different than a 17-month-year-old, <laughs> but you need the support nonetheless. <laughs> Great. So when, when you build a, a diverse culture at a place like Redfin, mm -hmm. uh, I'd like to kind of speak to how you do that from a, a point where you're building software, not just for customers, not just for technical users, but you're actually building software for employees that may be non-technical. What's the importance of diversity when you're building for non-technical teams? So uh, Redfin is not only a tech company, we're a real estate brokerage, and most of our workforce are on our real estate team. Um, they, we have, we have really real estate agents all around the country, and they come from all walks of life. They're 60% women. Um, and so it's super, it's super beneficial for our engineering team to be diverse. You know, like, 
we're building for humans either way, whether it's for the consumer or, or for your own team. But there's something different when a market manager or a real estate agent calls me and is like, this software is broken, or this is the pain point, and we have to have a live conversation. Um, being able to relate as a, on as many levels as possible is extremely helpful. And how does that, having people from diverse backgrounds help with that? Is that something that you can kind of anticipate some of those questions a little bit quicker or answer them a little bit more efficiently? Um, I mean, I think when you have a diverse team, there's just so many different communication styles that you just have a greater chance at yeah. hitting some combination that works. Um, and so something that might take a few iterations to get right if you can get that communication, the initial communication down, then hopefully you short circuit some of the, the feedback loop. Right. So in this conference, we're really focused on gender diversity, but tech hasn't been great at any level in any kind of diversity, whether it's age or race or ethnicity. Um, one of the things that we tend to focus on is black and Hispanic diversity in tech because the numbers are so abysmal. Um, I would like, though, to get your perspective as an Asian woman in management. Mm -hmm. How has that been? What's that been an experience in creating networks, finding mentors, asserting yourself, mm -hmm. your own leadership style? Mm -hmm. How has your experience been on that front? Uh, so I would say it's an interesting combination. So it's pretty hard in general to find um, women in leadership positions or at my level in the tech industry. It's hard to find Asians at my level in the industry, so finding that combination, like I, I haven't had much luck. Um, but I do think it's really important. My team is um, there are a lot of there are a lot of Asians, there are a lot of women on my team, and I'm a role model. And so um, I take my responsibility really seriously. There are times where I want to shy away from asserting myself, um, but I know I have to do it because there are a lot of people paying attention. Um, and so I think that's really important. And then does that go back to the building that culture where even if I'm, you know, I have to say, the time when I felt most comfortable, um, I was the only African American, but it was a very diverse environment. I was in graduate school and there were people from all over the world. I think for me that experience showed that there doesn't have to be a lot of you. Mm -hmm. There's just got to be enough support of everybody. And, and, and is that the goal in engineering, is to make sure that people feel generally supported until those numbers reflect what we want as an experience at Redfin and, and in tech in general? Yeah, I mean, not just because it's the right moral thing to do, but there's a real um, business reason for this, right? So. We're competing for we're competing against Google and Facebook and many other large companies that have way more money than we do and and more swagger in the industry and um, we just can't afford to not invest in a culture that is as inclusive and as supportive as possible um, and besides being a smaller company uh, Redfin San Francisco we're I mean, I usually avoid this word, but we're a satellite office. We're not headquarters. And so why would a top senior engineer choose to come work at Redfin San Francisco over any hot tech company that's headquartered in San Francisco? In, in San Francisco? It's got to be because they believe in the mission, but also because it's just the best place to work. Do you think, Jen, to be successful as a woman in engineering that you have to act like a man? <laughs> Um, if by that you mean you have to be confident uh, and, and, um, and speak up and, and, and sit at the table, then kind of, yeah, you do. And I think it's just really important as a woman to, to own it. Right. right. So how do you know when you're ready? Um, women, we, we doubt ourselves. We're our own worst critics. How do you know when you're ready to sit at the table or ask for that new assignment or go after that project? What's your cue? I'm probably the worst person to be asking. <laughs> <laughs> I've never felt like uh, I've been ready. Um, but I would say you have to surround yourself with people that you trust to give you feedback. And so... If you don't feel like you're a good judge of your own 
competency, then listen to other people around you. If other people are telling you, you deserve this, go for it, go for it, then you know, if you're hearing that a lot, then that probably means something. That's some advice that I should take for Seriously. myself. <laughs> and, and if you're not, I'm going to give you another advice. If people are not telling you, go for it, go for it, go for it anyway. Yeah. Um, <laughs> if, if it's a question in your mind, the only answer you're going to hear is no. And you go back and you figure out how to get to yes. So, um, but I think it's nice when someone can tell you that. Have there been mentors in your life? Or is there someone, one woman that inspires you? Uh, in the tech field? So two people come to mind. Um, one is going to sound super cliche, um, and that's Sheryl Sandberg. But the reason why is because of the vulnerability that she shows. I think it's really important for role models to be um, relatable. And I just really love that she... Uh, I mean, she published this whole lean-in book, and then later said that she, there's this whole segment that she, she wished that she had addressed, which was, you know, the single working mom. And, like, I just thought that was really cool that somebody who's so public and so visible could kind of own an oversight like that. And I, I found that to be inspirational. Um, but also, Bridget, I mean, she, I've worked so closely with her. Um, and she, we actually have this thing, this bet going where, like, she's still waiting for the day where um, afterwards she has to call me to tell me that, I talked too much in the meeting. Um, <laughs> and um, I mean, she pushes me and I, we have a relationship where I trust her and I know that like she's watching out for me. So that's Bridget's been um, a really instrumental figure in my career. Oh, that's fantastic. And do you have advice, if, if not everyone has a Bridget in their corner, <laughs> how do people go about getting the support they need to move up the ladder, to build the inclusive culture? You started out with someone who couldn't really relate to your experience, but was supportive of you as an individual, which shows that you don't have to have someone who has direct experience as you in order to build a culture of diversity. What, what are the key elements as people are looking for a company mm -hmm. if, or trying to build diversity and inclusion within their own company? Yeah. What do you think is essential to that task? I think it's really essential to surround yourself with people who share that value and that you trust, right? So if you join a company and you don't fit in, and you try to do something about it, but the management team is tone deaf, and the management team isn't supportive, I lucked out, right? Um, and or you chose wisely. I chose wisely. <laughs> um, you have to be careful about who you, who you surround yourself with, mm -hmm. I would say. Both from family, friends, and company. And if you're a working mother, who you marry as well. Yeah. <laughs> That's right. OK, are there questions in the audience that we can take? Okay. There you go. Hi, my name is Patrick, and I work at a, uh, a small startup here in Seattle that's comprised mainly of male engineers. And I'm here with Susan and the rest of the, the females I work with, who are awesome and amazing. And I want to know what, do you have any advice for me as a male in the office? How can I help? empower the people that I work with or bring more of these issues to the forefront to, to, to get to a higher level of diversity or at least enter that conversation. Yeah. Um, this is, my advice to you is, is advice that I continue to give myself, which is um, as a leader, you have to recognize that you are not going to be able to relate to everybody on your team. Right? And that's what our former CTO did for me and so I keep I remember that and I try to pay that forward so there are going to be days where someone on your team comes to you with a problem and you just don't relate you have you have to validate it and you have to listen um, and sometimes that's hard sometimes someone comes to me and I'm just like really like that's a problem um, but I have to fight against that feeling um, as a leader you have to you have to remain open and support people even if you personally don't experience that. Um, the more you do that, the more people will surface issues to you, right? So it creates a feedback loop. 
Hi. Beyond uh, what you did in terms of providing a private space for, for yourself and for other women at the company, what other things do you think are, are about to ch either changing or are about to change because of your experiences as a, as a mother? Neela and I were just joking earlier. Um, there's still this 5 p.m. walk of shame <laughs> where um, I have to, I, it's more like 4.59 where I'm, where I'm in a meeting, I'm trying to wrap up and I have to, I really have to run home uh, to meet the nanny. And um, I, I catch myself feeling embarrassed certain days where I'm like, everybody is watching me walk to the elevators right now and it's only five o'clock. We have all these summer interns, they're in college, like do they really understand, can they relate or is everybody secretly judging me, right? And so it's kind of like this shuffle and I'm hoping nobody sees my face. Um, and then I catch myself, I'm like, wait, 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 I'm a role model. So um, I, have to, I have to own it because there are other people, there are other parents in the office whether they're moms or dads, who are going through the same thing. Um, so I would say that that's the first thing that comes to mind. Um, and I think continuing to give parents um, the opportunities, you know, being flexible with work schedules. So I do go home at five, but I often work after I put the kid to bed. Um, and knowing that that's okay and really judging people by their work product, not necessarily the hours that they spend in the office. If I could just add to that two things. I, so I started the walk of shame about 10, 13 years ago. I've always been a working mother because I went to graduate school. So I had an eight month on my full time job. And when I started the walk of shame, I was doing it by myself. And then a couple of other mothers joined me. And then by the time I got to my previous job, men were joining me. And, and then it wasn't shameful. We were like, all right, let's go. It's 4.30. <laughs> we got to get our kid. We'll be back on the clock in a couple, couple of hours. So I think that's what's changing um, for young women. Also, I think it also goes back to if you build a culture of inclusion, then it's a culture that works for people who are mothers and choose not to be mothers or are not mothers. There's always something that an individual is passionate about outside of work, whether it's a child or a parent or a nonprofit, and giving people that space that it's okay to bring that passion to work and let that be a part of who they are, I think is really important in terms of inclusion. Okay, I'm coming back to you. Talk about a walk of shame. It's taking me forever. Oh, wait. Oh, sorry. Um, here, you can hold it. All right, I can hold it. Yeah. All right. Um, I'm Aubrey. I'm currently a freelancer, but I'm kind of looking to get into more possibly a corporate job, um, you know, for a better work-life balance um, or start my own company. I'm not sure at the moment, but one of the things um, that I worry about is finding a company that would be, you know, value diversity and value, you know, a working mother. What is your advice for that? I think Neela had some good advice earlier today. <laughs> I, I said this. Um, Back when I back a few years ago, when I I I was finished family building as a you know job, <laughs> having a nine year old and a twelve year old, I still looked at maternity policy because I felt like how companies treat parents is a good indication of their values as a company, whether it's maternity leave or paternity leave or adoption policy. I felt having those things in place was a good barometer of that. And then I would just ask questions on the interview because, you know, corporate culture, they can put every, all the kinds of stuff on their website. But it's really the person on the other side of that interview table that tells you whether or not you can leave at 3.30 to make it to your kid's recital. Like that manager is the person who decides your work-life balance. And so asking those hard questions, I think, is an important part of the interview process. You're, you not only want to impress, but you want them to impress you with their ability to accommodate your life. Sometimes it is hard to ask those types of questions in an interview. Um, you should also look at the makeup of the company, right? Are people in management positions from the executive level all the way down to your direct manager, do you ha are there parents? Um, are there people 
um, of diverse backgrounds. And that's another reason, it's a reason why it's super important um, on the flip side, when you're, when you're interviewing candidates, to have a diverse loop of people who are, who are running the interviews. And uh, that's actually kind of funny because, so at Redfin, we try really hard to make sure there's at least one woman on every interview loop, um, partially because making sure we're getting um, a, uh, diverse perspectives in the evaluation process. But um, in, in San Francisco, there's some teams where there's so many women, we actually have the opposite problem. Um, an engineering manager told me the other day, he's like, yeah, I had to make sure that there was at least one man on the loop. Um, and I thought that was pretty cool, but yeah. You don't hear that every day in San Francisco. <laughs> Other questions? Hi. Oh. I'm a recent new mom, and uh, you talked about the, the walk of shame at leaving the office at five. Um, you know, it's really important to build your network, and I see a lot of people going to happy hours, um, doing things that parents, male or female, um, can't necessarily partake in. So do you have suggestions to bring back to our own companies of things that we can do to promote, you know, that net, net type of networking, but with parents? We, we do try to avoid having um, a lot of events that exclude people like parents. So um, when we do have happy hours, they start a little bit earlier at 4.30, so I can be there for 30 minutes. Um, our hackathons, so some companies, they have hackathons, and those are around the clock. Our hackathons, we have keyboards down at 5 p.m., um, and that's to make sure that we're sending out a message that if you're a parent and you need to go home, um, you're not at a disadvantage because some other team is continuing to work around the clock. And, and in place of working around the clock, we will have like team building activities at night for people who are still able to make it. Um, but I would say being aware of the types of events that you're hosting and when they're happening extends beyond being sensitive to parents, right? Like if you are having a cocktail hour or a lot of alcohol related activities, you're excluding a certain group of people. And so um, it's not so much about designing um, networking or social activities to include a certain type of person, but back to what I was saying in the beginning, but you wanna make sure you have a culture that's supportive of everybody. Um, and so the best thing to do is to have a, a bunch of different types of activities. Like we do board game hours, we do have happy hours, we do, um, I think we have like candle making, uh, there are people who knit, um, so. Never done the knitting one. I just wanted to add, add to that. It's also how that's being perceived too. What we've instituted at Redfin is unconscious bias training, um, which is a, a big buzzword, but I think it does help us reflect on the biases that we bring. Like if someone's not in their seat at six, maybe it's because they got in the office earlier. If they're not at the happy hour, it's, there's another reason. So um, training your workforce not to just perceive information as negative no. before they know the person or the situation is really important part of building that culture. Okay, we've got a couple more questions. We're gonna start here and then over there and then just, are there any back there? Hi, uh, my name's Carly and I work at geocaching down in Fremont. And ironically, my boss is going on maternity leave today. Um, so I wanted to get some advice or tips for how I can be a supportive direct report for when she comes back to work. It's a nice That's, question. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, the best thing you can do is, is to ask her um, this is what I did. I've only ever done this once. I've only ever been on maternity leave once. Um, so I don't know if there's a better way to do this and maybe other people can provide advice. But um, I wasn't sure how available I was going to be or what, kind of, what state of mind I was going to be in on my leave. I did know that I wanted to have some way of checking in um, if I had some spare time. And so what I had my team do was um, send me... So I managed uh, three for uh, managers, and they would send me a weekly report. And so 16 emails was much more manageable for me to catch up on than like having to weed through all the, all the emails. I, I just kind of deleted everything else when I came back and started fresh. Uh, 
Uh, hi, my name is Amanda, and uh, myself and my colleagues were here. We work at a large Fortune 500 company based here in Seattle. Um, it's a pretty conservative company. Don't look at my badge. Um, <laughs> and, oh God, I'm getting photographed. Um, don't, someone tweeted earlier and I saw the back of my head and I'm like, oh God. <laughs> um, so anyways, okay, well, the reason why it's funny is because um, this is very taboo that we're even attending this. Redfin um, is hiring, you know that, right? And <laughs> <laughs> that was great. <laughs> Hashtag epic. Um, so, no, but we have, um, we've faced a lot of challenges in our attempts to get um, diversity programs introduced, in our attempts to get um, equality programs introduced. Um, I set up like a brown bag lunch as a disruptor of other people to just destroy the, join the disruption uh, table. And um, that was not well received. So I just kind of wonder like how much we should continue to push from the inside. Because I feel like if we, like a part of me feels like I want to give up. And then another part of me feels like if I give up, then like I'm giving up for all the people that are still there. And, and I, I almost feel like some sort of like, I'm, I'm extremely emotionally invested into um, my ability to make change there. So I just, I'm just kind of wondering your feedback and your thoughts, and I, I don't know if anyone else in the sure. uh, audience can relate to that, so. Um, hopefully, I'll, I, will, I'll, I will ask for sure. You know, I haven't always worked at Redfin. <laughs> I, I'm, my career has mainly been in finance, which doesn't have a stellar re record either. Um, it's on par with tech in a lot of ways. Uh, so I understand the frustration and I commend the effort, first of all. Um, that's amazing that you, you are that invested. I guess my best advice is to provide, to find those networking systems, either internally in small groups or externally. So just as an example, at a company that I work for that will remain nameless, <laughs> we were actually not allowed to meet as women, even though it was supported by management. So we had to give the internal networking groups a different code name, even though management sat in, which was weird. <laughs> but it just shows you how embedded company rules are, even as they're trying to change. So change is hard, networking helps, and not taking full responsibility for the problem will also help you personally, because you can't fix everything all at once. It is a process. And it sounds like you're, you're starting to make some efforts. But if there's anyone else in the audience, yes. Here. Um, I'll give you my, sorry. Uh, I was in a very similar position a few years ago. And I asked exactly the same question. And advice I was given that I followed, and thanks God I followed advice, was if you have the energy spent on creating something that's good, then banging your head against the wall, right? And it might feel you're leaving colleagues you love behind, but in terms of the impact you can make, what's a bigger impact and greater goodness that you can bring, right? And you can make that much of a change if you've, if you've already tried doing it, right? move on and try to build something where you can make a bigger change, bigger impact, and use your energy to make the world work better for more people, right, than where you are right now. So don't be afraid to leave. Thank you. I, I need to add, because I work where a lot of worked. <laughs> <laughs> um, and uh, I'm going to leave soon because I've been there for 17 years and I've done gender inclusion trainings and workshops and all kinds of things. Like, I, it's part of my brand there to focus on diversity and I'm done. <laughs> like, I'm done. And it's so sad and I'm mourning and I'm all weird. But, like, I, I think just because we're all saying, go, keep going, keep going. Like, I've, you know, been crying for months and dealing with, like, the morning, sorry, super eye contact. Um, <laughs> and it's, um, I, I gotta take care of myself, too. 
And so um, I, I no longer have the energy to push the boulder up the hill, and I have to see that the world is bigger than my little 17-year excursion. So... <laughs> have a couple years on me <laughs> from the perspective of investing yourself that's good right that's what you need to be doing and it feels good it feels right you're in the right spot my advice is you need a champion and you haven't found that champion yet in the company so how do you find a champion look for the guy that has daughters It's a wedge. It's where you go. Is this how you want your daughters to be treated? Is this how you want a company where your daughters are going to work? This is the person that's going to help you. So you've got to find that. Uh, beyond that, I also said, if you can't find that person, find somebody who was raised in a household full of women <laughs> with lots of sisters, because they're the ones who are more aware of what's going on. And that's what you need is find that champion. And, and if you can't find it in the company, if it doesn't exist there, um, then move on. But look for that person. Okay. I think that's a perfect uh, kind of point to go after. I'm from the same startup that Patrick uh, works at, and uh, we're here uh, along with some of our, actually all of our female colleagues. Uh, and the, you know, the champion point is very valid. There's, there are people out there uh, that are men that are wanting to help solve a lot of the problems that we have as well as, uh, you know, uh, I'm, I'm also a VP of engineering there and my selfish reason here is that I want to find the best people to add to this team. And there's a lot of great women engineers out there that we're not able to go and add to the team because we don't create the right environment. So there is a lot of desire, whatever the reasons might be, and uh, you have to go find those people. And uh, speaking of the daughters, I mean, Patrick has daughters. Byron, uh, he's here, he has uh, two daughters. I, would, I have a daughter who's, yeah. So that's, uh, it works. <laughs> our last question. Thanks. I'm Katie. I actually work with you. Um, you have only met you once. I've been at the company like three months. So my instinct is the same. It's a very conservative company and I've been trying to find people who wanted to kind of at a grassroots rally to make some of the changes. So to hear you say that you've been trying to make those changes gives me hope because that's one of the drawbacks I've had. I love the company, I love the people I'm working with, but there's definitely, it's male dominated. I mean, the dress code, everything, it's very conservative. And some of those changes they have to make just to get talent in the door. So I'd be willing to help you, and I know there are other people um, <laughs> out of grass.